Hello, everybody. This is episode 80 of the Intercooler podcast. I'm 80. Dan Prosser. <laughs> Number 80. 80. We're still here. We're, we're still going. It's 80 weeks in. It's bananas, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we're thing is, we're, th- we're going to have to start thinking about the 100th episode soon, aren't we? Oh, blimey. That's a frightening I, thought. I can't, even, I can't even think about that. But yeah. that's a bit, yeah, I say, but that's still 20 weeks away, isn't it? It is. So that's going to be sort of spring, isn't it? But it might take some planning. Maybe we need Ooh. a killer. Are we actually going pl- to plan a podcast? I mean, most unlike us. <laughs> no, okay, let's not bother with that. Uh, anyway, so I'm Dan Prosser, joined by Andrew Frankel. Hello. Um, as ever, Andrew's there. Yeah, hello. Uh, now, Andrew, we've got a good topic for this week, haven't we? The we racing do. cars, or rather the competition cars yeah. that never competed. Um, we need a bit of a sort of catch-all phrase for that type of machine. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure what that is, but we'll, we'll brainstorm later on and come up with something. Uh, Motorsport magazine last month um, actually ran a, a similar feature. So they picked out a few cars that never raced. They called them ghost racers, which uh, is quite nice, isn't it? Okay. Um, but we, we, yeah, we need something of our own. But between us, we've come up with a list of the sort of most fascinating cars that were developed, that were built, um, that were tested, but never raced for various reasons. Um, and we're going to run through a few of them and then sort of explain why they never happened. And I guess we're going to ponder what, what have we lost for these cars not actually competing? Um, how much more colourful might the motorsport world have been? I think it's also worth just considering how frustrating it must be for your life's work. Or, absolutely. Or rather, you know, for yeah. three or four years, whatever it is. Imagine just being absolutely single-minded on this one project. And then one day, it's dead. Yeah, and 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 in some cases um, that maybe we'll come to. I mean, sometimes at times these cars um, don't race because they just turn out don't turn out to be as good as they mm-hmm. should be. Um, but some cars um, are going to be absolutely brilliant, and they're going to be completely terrific, and all the testing data is just fantastic, and they got a world beater on their hand, and then some bean counter on the thirty fourth <laughs> floor just goes. Nah, no, not sorry. Happy. No, yeah. we didn't sell enough crossover SUVs last week, so you can't have your racing car. Can's the project. I mean, that must be absolutely soul destroying mm. for for a, something. You know, if you've done a duffer, then probably you're probably quite pleased that it, that, that, that that your failure is never going to reach the public domain. But if you've done a car, which is, I mean, the, the one I think about at the moment is the. Remember the Peugeot nine hundred eight hybrid? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that apparently was an absolute. So, we, you know, when, per, when did Persia win the more? Who can't remember? Um, it was 2009? Yeah, something like that. It was, yeah. Um, and anyway, so when they went to the hybrid era, Persia we and they had this car, and the testing data was absolutely electrifying. This thing was a missile. Mm. Um, and they just canned it. They just said, no, nope, not doing that. And that was the end of their Le Mans program. And they haven't been, you know, um, did they ever give yeah. a reason or has a reason emerged? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, uh, it was purely financial considerations. Mm. They literally, you know, it was it was an expensive program and they could see because it was a new era, it would not only, it would, and, we, and we know this about the hybrid um, sports car, wasn't it? It, it, it was, um, you know, until recent rule changes, an extremely expensive way to go motor racing. And I think what they could see was that it not only cost them an awful lot of money to develop the car, but that only got you into the ground floor. If you wanted to stay on the pace, Mm. um and let's not forget the other guys who were involved at the time um you know it was going to cost you know plenty of millions of euros um which they didn't feel like spending in whatever you know financial environment they found themselves in at the time which wasn't a good one for Persia. Mm. they were losing money hand over fist um so they just pulled the plug yeah gutting if you're okay never mind the engineers and the designers if you're one of the drivers slated to jump into this thing at le mans well imagine if you've already driven it yeah, and you know it. And, you know, you've been pounding around Rickard and you're going, oh my God, <laughs> this thing's fast. Um, we're going to, you know, we're going to show those Germans a thing or two. And um, yeah. and they suddenly go, well, uh, not only is the car not happening, but, you know, you're out of a drive because we count mm. the whole program. Gutting. And you yeah, find so, yourself up doing GT Pro or something. Yeah. Uh, mm. it's, yeah, I mean, that must be frustrating. It's That's a great example of the sort of thing we're talking about. And of course, whenever we do these almost list type podcasts, People will always um, cry, how could you forget such and such? Um, yeah. And so I think we should just turn that into part of the discussion. You know, we can't go through all of them. But if you think there's one that's got a really interesting story that we don't mention, send us a note, however you want to do that. 
um, and perhaps we'll stick something up on Instagram. Um, yeah. That's what I and think. And the thing is, with this subject, I mean, there are literally hundreds of these yeah. cars. Um, we're not going to scratch the surface of this. Up. What I hope we'll do is we'll get through more than through, through many, well, not all, but many of the more important and the more interesting ones. That's all we can hope to do, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, that's right. So I want to offer you one of mine now. And I oh, stuck God. a couple of pictures up on Instagram recently of this car, just with a sort of two sentence caption. Um, and I knew that it would just get a ton of likes because it's just a remarkable looking car. And the pictures that I posted of the Alfa Romeo 164 Pro car, um, yeah. there were some pictures of it with the body panels removed. And oh, you see, that, I know those pictures. They're such a cool looking thing, wasn't it's it? It's just extraordinary. You can and see you, the Formula One car underneath, can't you? You can. And you see the F1 V10 right behind yeah. the cabin, just mounted yeah. on the floor. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, it's just the coolest thing. So this yeah. was a... This was intended um, to replace the M1 Pro Car series, wasn't it? Which in the 70s, the M1 Pro Car was a... Uh, 80 and 81, I think, yeah. Okay. It was a category for... Basically, the Formula 1 drivers would have a punt around in these things, wouldn't they, during the race yeah. weekend? Yeah. Just as a... I Demolition can't actually, derby can't, before the, uh, before I the main event. Believe, yes. I can't believe it happened. And how yeah. brilliant would it be to have something similar now in equal machinery and really see who is? Would we still have Max and Lewis out the front or would... Antonio I mean, Giovinazzi it was. I mean, I, 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 I think in pro car, um, it wasn't always the obvious people out the front. A lot of the time, it was, but it wasn't always. Um, but yeah, um, it, what, a, what a wonderful thing that Alpha was. Um, yeah. And it was also itself. Um, you know, and we, we we talk about cars that never race, but you just think about the you know that was a three and a half liter V10 race engine. And which must have cost, I mean, you know, built from scratch. Mm. And that engine never raced either. I mean, we all know how much engines cost to develop. Um, I saw it. They brought it to a UK circuit, which I happened to be at. Um, I would have been very young at the time. Uh, well, not very young, I would have been a teenager. Um, it was Donington. I'm sure it was Donington. And this thing ran. <laughs> and the noise of it was absolutely indescribable. Um, um, I can remember just thinking this is going to be the most amazing thing ever. Mm. And we never saw it again. Yeah. So it was a silhouette racer, carbon and Kevlar. Um, yeah. But apart from that fairly apologetic wing on the back, it just looked like a 164, didn't it? It did. I mean, yeah. if you look, of course, if you look closer, you see the wheels and the, the, the camber and how low it is and all that stuff. But it just looked like a 164. Um, and so it didn't really have much downforce. Um, and presumably, therefore, it was a pretty frightening thing to drive oh i think it would have been horrendous yeah but yeah. it would have been amazing but, to watch 20 of them pound yeah. around wouldn't it but it was also um do you remember the here we go alfa romeo se 048 sp yeah oh, it, it was on my long list that car but I, it I was on your long well i mean I, I only mention it because it's you know it's directly connected to the pro car I mean, you know, that, that, that was, um, as you say, it was going to be this sort of, you know, um, one make series thing. But also underneath it were the bones of a Group C car, um, which was, you know, right at the tail end of Group C, um, you know, after the sort of Jaguar and Porsche era, when Persia dominated, when the rules changed to um, these sort of, you know, fighter plane, three and a half litre um, engines where, you know, you had the Persia 905 and the Jaguar XJR 14. And Alfa Romeo built one of those cars. How cool would that have been? And it had this V10 in it. How cool would that have been? 650 horsepower, screaming V10. Alfa Romeo just looked amazing. Ah, oh, it's a shame, isn't it? An Alfa oh. prototype would have been so special. So special. Yeah, so the 164 Pro Car never raced because the Pro Car series was binned and it didn't have anywhere to race. So yeah. I think they only built one and that was the end of that. Um, right, let's have one of yours. Can we do another Alfa Romeo? Let's have another Alfa Romeo, if you insist. Uh, okay, so we're going to go back a bit. We're going to get back about 50 years. Uh, we're going to go back to World War II. Um, in the 1930s, Grand Prix racing was dominated by the Silver Arrows, Mercedes versus um, Auto Union. Um, and Alfa Romeo had a good, what they call a Voiturette car, one and a half litre car. And the rules for the end of the 1930s and into 1940 and 41 were going to be a one and a half litre formula. So they decided that they were going to make their response to the total dominance of the Germans. And so they produced a car called the Alfa Romeo 
512. This was, get this, 80 years ago, a mid-engine, one and a half litre, twin supercharged, four cam, flat 12. What? <laughs> producing 350 horsepower at 9,000 revs. Wow. Oh, God, can you imagine what that would have been like? So a, a 12 cylinder engine, sorry, 1500 cc's divided flat by 12. 12 pistons. Yeah. They must have been like coins. Yeah. Oh, I mean, Ferrari actually did one in the mid 1960s, 1964, the year that John Surtees won the championship. Most of his races were with a V8, but they did do a 1.5 litre flat 12, the Ferrari 1512. Um, but this was like 25 years, even earlier than that. Yeah. I mean, that would have just wow. been, no I mean, it, and I think it was, it was, it was a Colombo engine. Um, and it wow. would, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Um, <laughs> that would have been, but I'm afraid Herr Hitler had um, other ideas about that. And uh, obviously it got made. Mm. I think there's a photograph of it and I think it was tested, um, but that's literally all. Um, Imagine what and, that must have sounded like. Oh, and, and, the, and the other side, seriously, what I don't understand, I need to go and have a look at, is the 158, which is the car they'd had before that, which was a one and a half litre car. That after the war, that dominated what they called Voiture Retro. Well, that, I mean, that dominated Grand Prix racing for, you know, the entire period after the war up until Formula One came in in the early 1950s. Mm. So why didn't they, I guess because they had the 158s and they knew it, they knew it and nobody had any money and I'm sure the 512 would need a lot of development and it was just too difficult because they only had one, or maybe the prototype didn't survive. I don't know what happened to it, but, mm. um, but I think I do know what happened to it. I think it's in the Alfa Romeo Museum. So I think the car has survived. Wow. Um, but anyway, yeah, one and a half litre, quad cam, flat 12, twin supercharged, 1940. That is extraordinary. Bloody yeah. hell. Mm. Okay, all right. Well, I'm not sure I can uh, best that, but I'll give it a go. So, I mean, this is a very well-known car. It's been described as the most famous unraced F1 car. It's the McLaren MP4 18. Um, and they were just, this was going to be the 2003 car, and they were basically just trying to catch the very dominant Ferrari team. Um, and it was, it was an Adrian Newey design. And it's basically Adrian Newey off the leash, it seems yeah. to me. Very aggressive aero, radical design. Um, and I, basically, it, it seems as though the car could have been incredibly quick, but it was just so compromised in that, that sort of typical Newey way, very tight packaging that meant it had huge cooling issues. Um, the mechanics hated working on it because uh, supposedly when they, when they were testing every time it came back into the pits they'd have to have a fire extinguisher ready to go because the thing would just ignite there's just no cooling air around it so tightly packaged it gets so hot um that it and it was just very difficult for the mechanics to work on um it was also fundamentally aero imbalanced the mp4 18 and so the drivers found it incredibly hard uh, to, to wrestle with. Um, both Alex Verts, the test driver, and Kimi Raikkonen, the race driver, had big crashes in it. McLaren publicly put both incidents down to driver error. Mm. Um, you can imagine how unhappy Kimi was about that, just to be yes. sort of called out by your team when actually the car was a nightmare. Um, and Newey writes about it in his book. His book's called How to Build a Car, isn't it? And he's called How to Yeah, so if, if you haven't read it, read it it's a fantastic yeah and it's absolutely not a sort of boffins treatise which is full of no. impenetrable statistical data it's just a really really good read sorry keep going <laughs> and he comes clean and he says that it was imbalanced aerodynamically um and they could address it slightly by taking away some front wing but then you just lost downforce uh, and yeah. so that's self-defeating and what actually was needed was to redesign the shape of the chassis and then maybe there would have been something in it but it was just such a such a tricky car to work on and to drive that it just they just never raced it. And so for 2003, um, they just stuck with the MP4 17D. So you know an evolution of the, the previous year's car, and the MP4 18 never raced. It's an interesting one though. It's I it, I love the fact that it was Adrian Newey really pushing the boundaries and perhaps you know like in in testing or in free practice the drivers have to push the boundaries and slightly overstep to understand how far they can go it just seems to me that the 18 was newey doing the same and then of course it wasn't too long after that he switched over to red bull and then they dominated the championship for several years didn't they in yeah the, 
after yeah. 2010. So I wasn't going to go with this car now, but seeing as it's about Formula One designers pushing the limits, um, yeah. can we just do the Lotus 88? We can. Okay. Um, so I think I think a lot of people know about the Lotus 88, um, the so-called twin chassis mm. Lotus. Um, the idea was that back in the ground effect era, um, you basically had to run a car with no springs because if you couldn't seal the back the layer between the car and the track, then you lost your ground effects. So, and and and, and a racing car, you know, literally, at the height of the ground effect era, the biggest single spring medium was the flex of the sidewall of the tire. Um, and while that works really, really well in theory, like your new e-car, in reality, the cars became undrivable. I mean, the drivers, you know, used to come out in the most terrible state. They felt they'd done like 15 rounds with Mike Tyson. Um, and so um, Lotus, led by Colin Chapman, just had this idea for a twin chassis car. So you had an absolutely rigid platform uh, and then you had a sprung chassis on, on top of that. So the, so the driver could feel the car and wasn't getting beaten up. Um, and it was an absolutely brilliant idea. Um, it was also, it was also, everybody thinks that the McLaren MP41 was the first yeah. carbon fiber Formula One racing car. It wasn't. It was the first carbon one Formula One racing car to race. Mm. Important distinction, but, isn't it? But, and also, you know, McLaren, I'm not taking anything away from McLaren here because they did it and they made it work and they, you know, an absolutely fair play to them. But they also went to another, they went to an American company called Hercules to get their carbon done lotus did it all in-house for the 88 and the 88 came out before the mp41 and it wasn't as if the the 88 was kind of like um i don't know kind of like some sort of, sort of concept you know the cars were built on three occasions during 1981 they went out and practiced and then they just got banned um you know individual race organizations mm -hmm. could say whether well, any particular car and 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 everybody so the car goes out everybody throws their hands out and uh, in protest the car gets chucked out it even got chucked out the british grand prix um which must have been fairly mm -hmm. fairly galling so it never raced um and I, I i think when it was absolutely new there were problems with it um but i think everybody could see it had enormous potential and obviously everybody else was terrified of it um and they kind of got together and made sure that that was that um such a shame so that's one that's killed by politics, by the, the opposition um, protesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think it did sail unbelievably close to the regulatory win, um, <laughs> you know, but, but, but you know, as, as, as you'd expect. But that's what, that, that's what you're supposed to do, isn't it? Yeah. Um, mm. OK, well, let's swap from Formula One to Le Mans. OK. Um, and I offer to you the Porsche LMP 2000. Oh, um, yes. So Porsche wins Le Mans in 1998 with the yeah. GT1, the 911 GT1, yeah. for the 16th yeah. time. Yeah. And at that point, there are people within Porsche, not least the CEO, Wendelin Wiedeking, who yes. is wondering, OK, so we can go win it for a 17th time. But what does that prove? You know, how does that further our cause? How does that demonstrate to the world that we are whatever? Um, so people are beginning to wonder, is it really worth a, a completely new um, program and campaign just to win Le Mans again. Um, so, I mean, they decide to investigate. Um, and what they need now is a prototype rather than a road derived car, rather than a production based car. They're moving towards a prototype. And of course, as you well know, um, with the WSC 95, Porsche and Yoast sort of came to realize what came to understand and appreciate what a purpose built prototype could achieve. Yeah. Um, and so they, they set up down this road of a, a, a ground up prototype, an open top car, um, and it's going to be powered. And you have to remember this a little bit by a V10 engine. Um, and what they, what Norbert Singer, the great engineer realized is that for endurance racing, of course you need good fuel consumption. Um, and at that time, rather than turbo power, what you needed for good consumption, good, good fuel efficiency was displacement. Um, and so they had to get rid of the flat six turbo engines and bring in a different engine, a bigger engine. Um, and that turned out to be a V10. Um, now, Wendelin Wiedeking, he challenged the people who were running this, um, this program. He said, who is, the, who is the most famous sports car manufacturer in the world? And the response, of course, was Porsche. And Wiedeking said, well, prove it. And his point was that 
okay, they'd had the, the 959, which was a supercar, but ultimately a derivative of the 911. They'd had the GT1, uh, the road car, again, a supercar, but it's ultimately um, a derivative of the 911. So at that point, Porsche had never gone out and built a ground up supercar for the road, a totally clean sheet supercar for the road. And so Vida King was of the view that doing that and building something very special would demonstrate to the world that Porsche could exist up in that, that rarefied strata um, rather than just going off and winning Le Mans again. However, they did, uh, they did get quite a long way down the road with this LMP2000. And the thing did run um, at Weissach. It just didn't ever race. Um, and the, there are a couple of stories here. Some say that resources were diverted from the LMP2000 to the KN because it was an enormous undertaking at the time, wasn't it, for Porsche yeah. to develop its first SUV? And so that well, was not, not, not just it, but they, I mean, they did the Volkswagen as well. Yeah. So, so it's a huge drain on resources. Yeah. 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 Physical, uh, human resources, certainly. Yeah. And so there was that factor. And also the Vida King factor let's go and build a very special supercar. Um, and ultimately, that's what they decided to do. So the LMP2000 never raced. However, the engine did have a life. In, and it started life in the mid 90s as a V10, as a, a Formula One research project. I mean, car manufacturers do this all the time, don't they? If we were to build a Formula One engine, what would it look like? Let's investigate. And then it evolved through the years and it became a 5.5 liter NA V10 in the LMP2000. And when that was scrapped, the engine was developed further. It was increased to 5.7 liters and it became the power plant called the Carrera GT. Um, and so it's just a lovely story how from a Formula One research project via a stillborn Le Mans prototype, we had the Carrera GT, which is still just one of the iconic road going supercars, isn't it? Which I've never driven. Which I've never driven either. Thankfully, yeah. we know someone who has one. <laughs> We're gonna put that right. And we'll let you know about it when we do. We'll um, put that right. Staying at Le Mans, but again, yeah. going back, um, it's interesting that I'm doing all the old ones, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Jaguar XJ13. Um, I think everybody listening to this knows what the XJ13 is. Um, and it's just another one of those agonizing what if stories. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the reason the car didn't race wasn't that it was a bad car, it was that it was a late car. And it said everything about, you know, the, that sort of, slack lackadaisical approach to such things by you know british management of you know companies like jaguar in the mid 1960s that just got it delayed and delayed and delayed so the car so the xj13 was it was meant to be you know jaguar having had all this success in the 1950s with the c type and with the d type um they made actually they made a car um which was very unsuccessful which was meant to be the sort of the link between the d-type and the e-type called e2a which dan gurney raced at Le Mans in 1960 i think described it as the worst car he'd ever driven um and so jaguar kind of went away um but they did want to get back into um sports car racing um and they designed this you know they got malcolm sayer um this absolute genius of an aerodynamicist to design this beautiful mid-engine car. Um, they designed from scratch this five litre um, quad cam V12 engine to go in it. And it should have raced in 1965. Now, if you think that in 1965, Le Mans was won by a customer Ferrari 250 LM with a 3.3 litre engine, if you'd gone there with a five litre Jaguar, which would have had well, it had just over 500 horsepower. So it probably had the thick end of 200 horsepower more than the Ferrari that won the race. If it could have got round, and of course, you know, getting to Lemoore is one thing, finishing Lemoore is another, but if it could have got round, you know, this thing was so slippery, it would have gone barreling down the straight, up, you know, the thick end of 200 miles an hour. Um, I think, you know, there's a very, very good chance, given that, you know, all the GT40s failed, um, that it would have absolutely mopped up, but it didn't. It was late. Um, and by the time it was ready, which was probably about 1967, the world had just moved on. You know, the, the GT40 by that stage with its monster seven-litre engine, which was also reliable, and they had the Mark IV as well, 
Um, and the car was obsolete before it was ever ready to race. And it's just such a, it's just such a sad story. I mean, the V12 obviously lived on. Um, some people have suggested that it's unrelated to the V12 that went into the road cars in the 1970s and carried on until, you know, goodness knows when it's into the 21st century. It wasn't unrelated at all. The two, the two engines, so the race engine in the XJ13 and the V12, which we all know about in the E-types and the XJ12s and that sort of thing, they were related engines, even though they were, they were much evolved. Um, so it wasn't that nothing came out of it, but, you know, that could have been such a great thing, um, a great thing reason to be proud about British sports car racing and, and, and Jaguar as we had been in the 1950s but nothing ever came of it and you know the car survived it got smashed to bits once during promotional filming I think in 1971 with Norman Jewis but they rebuilt it um, I've driven it it's a lovely thing to drive mm -hmm. um, it's got a you know it, it, it's got a nice slow synchro mesh box like they put in Porsches because they realized even then that you know gearbox failure with the uh, those very unforgiving dog boxes was the most likely cause of retirement in a race like the Moor. So <clears throat> it so easily could have been. Um, mm. It might to this day still hold the lap record at Myra. Um, oh, wow. David Hobbs, lunatic, lap Myra at 166 miles an hour average around there. And I know that basically nobody listening to this will ever have been to Myra, but it's not like a sort of, a speed bowl like Millbrook, where you can just go around and around and around. It's not. It's straight, connected by unbelievably steep banking. Um, and, you know, I have probably done an average of, I don't know, 135, 140 around there and somewhere, and absolutely scared myself with this. The idea of doing over 165 wow. around there. I mean, just how fast would you have to be going down the straight to be able to... Anyway, um, so... A great, great thing, and uh, I mean, it's great that the car survives, but yeah, how much greater would it have been if it actually got to race? It's so beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful car, really is stunning. stunning. And I think there are pictures of um, the the Norman Jewish crash at Mar oh, there are, yeah, 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 it wasn't there, yeah. You see it buried in a plowed field, don't you? Yeah, um, yeah, wow, what a cool thing. Okay, right, we're going to switch disciplines entirely now, um, and talk about rallying, a rallying, go rally. on. Uh, and I, I just want to talk about Group S. So, you know, a whole category that got binned um, yep. and lots of or several very exciting cars that were that were built for it, that were designed for it. So as we know, Group B was just a monstrous category and it was it was getting too fast and the cars were too crazy. And so the FIA was going to bin it anyway. It was going to be dropped in the sort of latter part of the 80s um, for a new category called Group S. Um, and now, of course, when Henry Toivonen and Sergio Cresto died um, on the Tour de Course in 1986, the FIA decided to hasten the demise of Group B, and they got rid of it at the end of the year. But with it, Group S as well, um, switching instead to the production formula, Group A, um, because it had to be seen to be taking drastic action. Too many people had lost their lives as a result of Group B. Um, and... They just had to switch back to cars that were actually slower, less powerful. Um, and that's why they switched to Group B, Group A, excuse me, rather than this new Group S formula. However, there are lots of people who are cross about that because the Group S cars were not necessarily road-based. Um, and so there was the potential for them to be significantly safer than a road-based car. Um, also, they were capped. They, were, they only had 300 horsepower. So significantly less than Group B um, and actually about the same as the Group A cars. So to a lot of people, it would have made sense to have stuck with Group S because they wouldn't have been a great deal faster, um, certainly not to begin with, than Group A cars. Um, but they would have been safer because they weren't derived from a road car. Now, there were a handful of these things built. And the, the important thing about the, the regulations was that only 10 had to be built for the car to be homologated. And so you're essentially looking at a prototype rally formula prototype rally cars um just build the fastest machine you can possibly conceive and, and, um, and just with, for, for the, within the power sorry, limit yeah Go on. so and just for those who don't know and i include myself in this um presumably there has never before or since been a prototype rally formula um no it hasn't happened i mean the world rally car uh, regulations that we've had and different sort of versions of them since 
um, since the, the late 90s um, have been, they're still based on production cars. I mean, the yeah. current cars that we have are wild, but they still have to be derived from showroom models to some degree. Um, and so, it's, no, it's never happened. And we, we saw, and they're very well known, there were a handful of cars designed and built for this category. The Lancia ECV was one of them, ECV, yeah. Experimental Composite Vehicle. It was due for the 88 season. Um, it had a 1.8 litre twin turbocharged engine, mid-engined, of course, like the S4. Now, in theory, the engine could produce 600 horsepower or something, but of course, that would have been, been pegged all the way back um, to 300. But it, it was just made of incredibly sophisticated materials for the time, Kevlar, carbon fiber. So it was, it was technologically speaking, a very interesting car. However, the Group S car that really demonstrated the potential of the formula was the Audi, the Audi Group S car, because it looks like a sort of rally slash Le Mans car hybrid thing. Yeah. Look at it now. It could almost be, you know, ripping along the Mulsan Strait. It just looks like a, a, an odd, almost LMP1 car. Um, there was also a Lada. There was a Toyota. There was an Opal. Um, and sadly, none of these things ever competed. But and we're just sort of left wondering what might have been if these Group S cars had been allowed to compete, and, and are, are also they, are, how might that formula have evolved? Yeah. And are all these things sort of languishing in museums now? Presumably they still exist. Yeah, well, the, the Audi has actually been demonstrated a few times recently. It has yeah. run. Um, but the thing is, they were, because these things never competed and they were never developed over a number of years, um, the cars that were built got nowhere close to scratching the surface of the potential of the Group S regulations. And so we'll just never know. Ah, Sad, isn't it? Pity. Sad. Yeah. Blimey. Um, are you going to talk about the Polo as well? Okay, I'll just, this is my last one then. So, yeah, I mean, VW, so the, the, the regulations that we have at the moment in the World Rally Championship and will uh, actually be replaced at the end of this year, they came in, in in 2017. And so VW had dominated the WRC for four years with the Polo. Um, and it set about developing a car for these new regulations, which ultimately it was... If you, you just have to look at one of these cars, the current WRC cars, to understand how much aero they have. It's so sophisticated yeah. aerodynamically and more power than the previous WRC cars as well. And we saw on Rally Finland a couple of weeks ago just how frighteningly quick these things are. And, and VW was developing its car to go up against the Toyota, the Hyundai, the Ford. Um, but of course, the timing was all wrong. Um, Dieselgate happened. When did Dieselgate happen? 2015? Well, 15, it broke, yeah. The yeah. story broke in 15, but the, 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 the true extent of particularly the cost um, certainly yeah. wasn't becoming evident until 16. And we just saw uh, across the VW group, didn't we, how motorsport programs were just scrapped? Yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, so obviously we know that the Porsche um, Le Mans program was scrapped. Um, less known to the point that people, some people at Bentley will still deny it, is that they had what would have been then an LMP2 car. Mm. Bentley wanted to have an LMP2 car. Wow. Um, they wanted something to um, celebrate their centenary. Bentley centenary was in 2019. Um, and Bentley has this thing about never entering a race it had no chance of winning. Um, and they knew that they couldn't go and build a car to race at Le Mans having that chance of outright victory nor because with the... Um, with the LMP1 hybrid race being where they were, I mean, that was just a cost. But, but they thought they could go to Daytona and they could race a car in America, Sebring and so on and so forth. Um, and that's their biggest market. And so that's what they decided to do. And Bentley would have had a factory works racing car. Um, yeah, uh, in, in time for their centenary. And that was going to be their big yeehaw. And I know this, however much anyone might want you to deny it, because Wolfgang Durheimer, who was the boss of Bentley at the time, told me about it. Oh, wow. Much to the, much to the chagrin of the PR person who was with us at the time, who basically had his head in his hands. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, what a shame. That was another programme that, you know, fell under the diesel yeah. gate bus yeah. um, <coughs> and uh, never saw the light of day. I'm not even sure. I mean, I, I know they didn't build the car, um, but they'd, they, would, they would certainly have scoped it all out. They would have certainly yeah. know exactly what it was going to be. Um, and then it wasn't. Well, I, I suspect you've got a whole list of them that we could run through. But do you want to choose one or two more? And then we'll put it there. 
I'm in a bit of a flat 16 mode as well at the moment. So, okay, oh, so gosh. in the mid 60s, um, Coventry Climax, which had made the V8 engine, which, you know, um, had powered Jim Clark to his world championships. And by 1965, they thought there's something they needed something a bit more. Um, and so they were going to do a flat 16. And they had a thing, I think it was called the, oh, what's it called? The FWMW, something like that. And so there was a flat 16. And that was going to be a sort of, a production engine so um lotus were going to have it brabham were going to have it cooper were going to have wow. it um and this would you know this engine would have been um launched for the 965 season um but it proved to be well three things one is it was tricky to develop um the engine was not reliable from the start second in 1966 the three liter formula was coming anyway so it would only be around for a year and third the V8 they had was still the best engine in Formula One. Um, and so they just stuck with that in the end. But that's, you know, that was another, you know, fantastic. Wait, hang on. So was that going to be, what was the displacement going to be? One and a half litres. 16 cylinders? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Less than 100cc per yeah. piston. Yeah. How cool would that have been? Crikey. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Actually, there was, okay, there was one car, the Lotus 39, mm. which was designed for this engine. And then it didn't get the engine. And so they stuck a, what did they do with it? They stuck a two and a half litre engine in it and they went off and did Tasman in, in Australasia. So, um, um, so yeah, so, so that didn't happen. So that was, you know, that, that would have been quite cool, wouldn't it? Because, you know, BRM obviously had their H16, a three litre engine. Um, and BRM also had the V16 um, in the early 1950s. And this was going to be a flat 16. Um, yeah, which a shame. has never been done. Oh yeah, I mean, the only shame. other the only other flat sixteen I can think of was the flat sixteen that Porsche built for the nine seventeen mm. to go Can Am racing and also to scare the shit out of Ferrari, <laughs> which they did. Um, but then they suddenly thought, now we'll just stick a turbo on the old engine and mm. just go have much more power for much less effort. So they did that. A um, couple of six wheeled cars for you. Go on. The be the Williams FW seven D. Okay, mm. everybody remembers the six wheel Tyrrell, which had two, four little wheels at the front and two big ones at the back. So the Williams were the other way around. Um, they wanted, um, they had four little wheels at the back. And actually, that, it, was a much, it was a much cleverer idea because the problem with the Tyrrell was it still had these massive rear wheels. And ultimately, that's what affected the car's frontal area. Okay. Mm. The Williams didn't have that. Um, so not only did they have, um, smaller wheels so their frontal area was massively reduced so there's a huge aero benefit there they also had enormous traction as you can imagine because mm -hmm. you've got four tires rather than two pushing you forward um and you know briefly it looked really really good um i know that i think keki rosberg tested it jonathan palmer tested it and the car was um the car was really quick and i've seen it run it run up, uh, up the hill but um i'm not sure why they canned it um but it was it was it was an example of Patrick Head at his genius best. Mm. Ferrari, Ferrari did a, uh -huh. did a six wheel car too. Did they? Um, yes, they did, um, and there are photographs of it. I think I'm sure I've seen photographs. It was the three so you know, the three one two, which was a type of car that came in like 1970. There was a three one two T. Well, there's a three one two B, B two B three, three one two T, T two, T three, T four, and T five, which everybody knows about. What they don't know about is the T six. Mm. which had and that was this was a this was another completely different six wheel concept so instead of having so this was like the williams it had, its four wheels were at the back but instead of being on two axles um or four axles if you like um they were twin wheels so the wheels sat side by side oh. like a juggernaut like a dually yeah so you had two narrow wheels on the same axle either side um wow and <laughs> I think the car was horrible. Carlos Reutemann um, tested it at Fear Run and absolutely hated it, uh, and it never went any further. But it's another interesting car. Mm. Um, that didn't, I do love uh, that there was an era where these these titans of the sport were just experimenting with what seemed like completely bonkers ideas, almost yeah. just in case. What if? Yeah. Uh, well, exactly. And you know, you just can't do that now, can you? There's just no scope for anything like that anymore because the rule book is so tied down. Yeah. You know, you, you forget the number of wheels. You can't even, you've got no choice over the number of cylinders in your engine or, the, or, or anything. You just have to, you know, do what you're told, which is a shame.
okay, so that's a podcast about the racing cars or the competition cars that never competed. Um, if we've missed any, let us know. And the best we ones did. we will mention, yeah, I'm sure. Because I haven't even talked about the Hill GH2, have I? Oh, crikey. Well, you're going to have to write a piece about that then for Instagram. Um, <laughs> yeah, so get in touch. I, I just realised that we could probably do one on the racing cars that did race, but shouldn't have. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking <laughs> maybe a front end, a, a front wheel drive LMP1 car, perhaps. That should be on the list. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good. Okay. Well, let's leave that one there. That was fun. Um, please, everyone, remember to rate and review the podcast. That does matter. And remember as well to download the Intercooler app. We've had some great stuff on there. Uh, just recently, our in house engineer, David Tuig, has explained why, in his view, the Alfa Romeo 4C was never the car that it should have been. It's an interesting piece. Um, if you haven't downloaded the app yet, if you haven't started your free trial, please go and do so now. Uh, we think you'll like it. Um, and as ever, we'll be back to talk to you again next week. For our 81st podcast. 81. Boof. Mm, blimey. All right. All the best. Bye, everyone. See ya. <laughs>